welcome Alex Carr, who um, is so, we're so lucky to have you today. Uh, I'm going to read his bio. He's a candidate uh, in the geography department at UC Berkeley, uh, lives in Los Angeles, and he's conducting research for his dissertation on the renaissance of urban agriculture. Thank you. Um, so I thought it was very piquant of what's happening today with, um, with the market, everyone sort of starting to grow um, things and raise things in their yards. Um, and Alex will talk more about that. Oh, and one more second. We're, um, we're trying to hold questions at the very end um, so we can kind of get his all the information. Thanks. And I'll leave that. Um, so, uh, so, well, first I want to say thank you to Joseph for inviting me at the Railroad Time Bank. This is a lot of fun for me. Uh, and then giving talks and sort of stuff in academic settings. Um, so what I was going to do today is sort of very quickly take a hero story about uh, a part of Los Angeles that most people don't remember or know about. Um, that I really think it was beyond kind of most people in these sort of food circles now know about Victory Gardens. Is anybody not familiar with Victory Gardens? So that's sort of a story that's getting told a lot these days within the sort of urban food movement, the sustainable food movement, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think there's a more interesting and a more sort of robust story in the history of Los Angeles. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little about, about how you can find out more about this, because I'm not going to cover all of it in a few minutes. And actually, there's a lot of it that's still being covered in this history. So and it takes a lot of sort of uh, amateur time at the archives and going through things, going to old newspapers and that kind of stuff. So uh, to begin, I'm going to go back to 1900, about the turn of the century, the last century, I guess now. Uh, in Los Angeles, and does anybody have a guess about how big LA was in 1900? About 35,000. It was actually about 100,000 people by 1900. But by comparison, Chicago, which was sort of the second, becoming the second city at the time, was 1.7 million people. <coughs> so LA was a tiny little outback town. By 1930, by the sort of height of the Great Depression, the city had actually grown to 1.2 million people. So the city really became a city in less than 30 years. And what's really interesting about that to someone like me, and I think to people sort of in the history of the city, is how much that meant that people were really planning the city in the 20s, particularly the teens and 20s and 30s, that there was this real sense of LA was going to become a real city and what do we want that city to look like? And there wasn't really an agreement except that we don't want it to look like the East. We don't want it to be crowded, we don't want it to be dirty, we don't want industrial smokestacks, but we want a city, we want everything the people in the cities have. We want culture, we want jobs, we want banks, we want, and then in LA, we want sunshine and beauty and all these things. So one of the things that developed is a group of people really started talking about the small farm home as a concept. And the basic idea was someone, a family could move to LA either from a city if they wanted to get out of the city, or they could move from the countryside if they wanted to move into the city. And come to LA and buy um, a subdivided tract of land. And the tract would be anywhere from half an acre to 1.5 to 2 acres, um, which is a lot smaller than your average farm, but a lot bigger than your average lot. Just to give you a sense of perspective, this lot is just over an acre, I think. So it's a big piece of property, but not unreasonable for a town. And so this family would arrive in LA, and they would buy their subdivided plot off and on old agricultural land, on old uh, grape vineyards, there used to be a large wine industry in LA, or old orange groves that had become unprofitable. They would often build their own house, um, and then start planting their own food. So the idea was to grow enough fruits and vegetables and small livestock to be able to basically supplement your income. And uh, if you look on the sheet, so sorry, I didn't explain the sheet for those of you who got them. Um, the front side is basically <coughs> excerpts from historical documents to kind of give you a sense of what was going on in the back. It has references to where those are from and where you can find more information. So the first sort of block of text was an explanation of what the small farm home was. And really the idea was it was less about a certain like this is precisely what it is, more about a lifestyle. And people were really interested in preserving a sort of an agrarian, rural set of practices and beliefs that they really felt were dying as the United States was becoming an industrial uh, urban place in the 20s. Um, so what gets really interesting is this was not just a group of people with this like idea. It was really happening. There were thousands and thousands of these homes built all over the city of Los Angeles, and the county, I should say. Um, there was about in, there was a historical document in the 30s that we did a land use survey, and there's something around 500 acres of small farm homes in the Pasadena area um, by 1935. 
Uh, but what became very interesting to me doing all of this was um, the, the organizations like the LA Chamber of Commerce got very excited about this, and they were really the ones promoting it. And they started publishing these small booklets called What the Newcomers Should Know About Small Farmers in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one was actually published in 1927, two years before the Depression started. So it's really when people were feeling wealthy and excited, and this was like going to be the great new city, and then the Depression hits, and they started publishing even more of them. And they said, this is a great way for hard economic times for people to come to the city. Uh, and keep bringing people here, like, not uh, go broke or starve for those kinds of things. Um, and the guides are fascinating, and you can see them. They're in the, they're in the LA Public Library, they're in archives. I haven't found one online yet, but there's, there's similar stuff. Um, let me show you so the guides were very, had a very sort of, not strict set of prescriptions, but guidelines of who should be doing this. And they really, they wanted people who were going to know what they were doing. They wanted people who were going to um, really build a house, invest in the land, stay on the property. Um, and they wanted people who had jobs. It was really, they were very, like, over and over and over again, said, this is not subsistence homestead. This is supplementing your income. They had precise numbers, you could say, depending on how large the land was and the time period, but a couple hundred dollars a year on groceries, uh, basically, which was a lot of money, right, in the 20s and 30s. Um, and they would say things like, make sure you live near your subway or your <coughs> red car line. They would not assume that people had cars yet. Uh, it's the great myth about LA that the city sprawled because of cars, it really sprawled because of the red line. Um, but saying that people should like expect to go to work five to six days a week on the red car, not live more than 15 miles away, and then come home on the weekends to their garden, tend their goats, their sheep, their rabbits. Rabbits were very popular. They were changing diet. I don't know rabbit anymore, but they might come back. I don't know. Um, obviously chickens. And they then say like, do not expect to make a profit on your food. This is really for your family, and maybe you could have some extra eggs, some extra chicken meat that you can trade to your neighbor and that kind of thing. Exactly what people are getting really excited about doing now, right? That you can make your own cheese at home and trade it with your neighbor for eight, or maybe sell it for a few dollars and help you buy your own steak or whatever it is you want to buy. Um, so they, the Chamber of Commerce was promoting this. LA Unified School District and the other school districts in the area were also very involved in promoting the idea of home gardening and home farming on these small farms. Um, they would have class projects where students would grow out alpha to learn how to do it, and they would be expected to do it at home. There's great pictures um, from the 1950s, all the way up to the late 50s, of children at their homes with their home gardens and learning how to do this. Um, it really came out of this kind of excitement. Um, and then eventually what actually happened is the person who was really in charge of and there's, he's this great guy named um, Ross H. Gast. Oh, no, sorry, he's going to pass the program. So please be careful of this, it's the libraries, it's not mine. <laughs> um, but I want to pass it around so people can see it. So uh, Gast started out at the LA Chamber of Commerce, and he then went to the LA Times to promote small farm homes, and then he left and went to the Department of Agriculture. Um, and he originally published the first volume in the 20s, and then this is a thinner, newer version of the Victory Garden edition from the war era. Um, and I'll just, if people want to look at it, and it's, it's kind of what you would expect from a gardening guide now about how to plant, when to plant, um, instructions for irrigation, what fruits and crops would grow in certain areas, um, but also all these things about what to expect about your life and being an industrial worker or working in a bank or those kinds of things. Um, oh, so where I was going with all this is and the federal government got very excited about this during the Depression. And the um, Farm Securities Administration, which is one of the New Deal organizations, really took verbatim the reports um, and studies that were done on small farm homes in LA to model na national and federal programs on really redesigning communities for people who were um, displaced by the Depression. They would, they would sort of the first um, large scale suburban home, tract home, like what we would expect to see now in LA, they were doing in places like El Monte. Uh, there were, I think, 1,400 houses built in El Monte. Um, and I'm, actually, on the back of the sheet, if you look, there's a link, or there's a, one of the recommended sites is the USC Online Digital Archive. Um, and also the National Archives have amazing photos uh, from the Depression of like, 